Before you get into this episode of The Missing Crypto Queen, I'd love to tell you about our new podcast, Bad People, with me, criminal psychologist Dr. Julia Shaw, and comedian Sophie Hagen. I've spent my whole career trying to work out why people do bad things, and in our new podcast, we venture into dark and often taboo subjects using real criminal cases and research from criminal psychology to understand why people commit such horrible crimes. Subscribe to Bad People on BBC Sounds and listen to the end of this episode of The Missing Crypto Queen for my take on whether Dr. Ruja is actually evil. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Quick warning before we begin, this episode contains strong language. You came very close to her in Frankfurt. She's not there now. I don't think she's in Germany anymore. She'll be somewhere where nobody expects her to be. After everything that's happened, she's felt the network closing around her. So there are two options. Either she's extremely cautious because she's felt the network closing in, or otherwise, when she's not there anymore, she cannot, well, You've seen what happens. People talk. They sing. What would a big criminal organization do with people who could be such a liability for them? You know how it works. Fifteen months ago, Georgia and I set out to find Ruja Ignatova, the founder of an exciting new cryptocurrency called OneCoin. You're amazing, guys. <laughs> Thank you. She promised financial revolution and huge returns for investors. In two years, nobody will speak about Bitcoin anymore. Billions of euros were invested from all over the world. You sold some goats. Yeah. You did that for one coin. Mm. There was no other way. But OneCoin was nothing but an old-fashioned pyramid scam with no real technology behind it. OneCoin is not a cryptocurrency. There is no blockchain and I can prove it. Dr. Ruja hasn't been seen since October 2017. And for months, we were following her tracks. Do you know her? <laughs> as soon as we mentioned her name, it just caused this great fraud. Ignat of something, something, I've, I feel I, I heard it some, sometime. And trying to uncover the truth about her fake cryptocurrency OneCoin. I hope you understand the vision of this company and how powerful it is. And just at the very end of our search, we were contacted by someone who didn't want us to use his voice, but told us we might have got close. You did the right thing by going to Frankfurt. You must dig deeper. But now, months later and still no news, that same source tells us that the Frankfurt lead has hit a dead end. But the thing about this story is that every time one lead goes cold, new leads seem to appear. A lot has happened since episode 8. I'm Jamie Bartlett, and this is The Missing Crypto Queen. Episode 9. Follow the money. Welcome back. When we first started recording this series in March 2019, Ruja's younger brother Konstantin Ignatov, who'd taken over as boss of OneCoin after Ruja vanished, was arrested by the FBI. OK, now he gets arrested. I go back to Bulgaria. You, so you were with him? You were with him when he got arrested? Yes, I was. Right. Can you talk us through what happened on that? Oh, geez, it was... Remember Duncan Arthur? 
Duncan ran OneCoin's Deal Shaker platform, the online marketplace selling products in exchange for OneCoin. Vapor only water, Wellness thermal so imager, for consultation here via Skype from Russia. The one that OneCoin promoters claimed was a world beating e commerce site. Tina Adult Pampers. Gold eyelids? What? Which it's not. When the FBI arrested Constantin, he wasn't alone. Duncan Arthur was standing right next to him. We fly out to San Francisco. We go through immigration. I sail through. You know, I stand around. No Constantine. No Constantine. No Constantine. Eventually he comes out and he's got his passport in a little pink bag with a lock on it. So I said to him, oh, what, what, what's happened? So he says, no, I've got to go for further questioning. So he goes and speaks to this massive fucker with red hair, disappears into an office. I'm hanging around. And this lady comes to me and says, what are you doing? So I said, no, I'm waiting for my mate. So she says to me, well, unless you want the same thing to happen to you, you fuck off, in those words. So I go and I get onto the plane to Las Vegas. Six hours later, Constantine arrives after they've questioned him. So he caught a later flight. But they've taken his phone away. They've taken his laptop away and his luggage is missing. We do the Las Vegas thing. He wanted to go to Los Angeles. I've never been to a shit place in my life. It's terrible. We go to the airport and we're just keen to get out. And we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. The flight is delayed by about two hours. You know, and nobody can explain why. So then there's an announcement. Can Duncan Arthur and Konstantin Ignatov please come to the counter? So we thought, well, they must be boarding business class first. So there we go, happy, 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 pushing each other, all the rest of it. So we go to the counter and he says to the lady, are we going first? And she says to him, well, nobody else is going where you're going. So we thought, well, we must be the only people in business class. We walk through the door and there are five big guys there in blue and they've all got badges around their neck. Two of them grab Constantine, swing him around and the third cuffs him and he disappears into the store just like this. Then I feel this hand, then I feel another hand and I think, oh fuck. They take me to a room and they start quizzing me. So the first thing they said to me is, where's Ruja? They give me a document which is a summons to appear before a grand jury in the Southern District of New York in seven hours. Now it's physically impossible to get from where I am to New York. You're in LA still? Yes. So I said to them, well, this is physically impossible. Well, they said to me, well, then never come back to the US again. Duncan never saw Konstantin Ignatov again. For months, nobody knew what had happened to Konstantin. Would he be released? Charged? Where was he? Nobody seemed to know. Then, on the 5th of November 2019, the week after the last episode of our series went out, an American lawyer called Mark Scott walked into courtroom number 318 at New York Southern District Court, a large wood-panelled room with high ceilings. He was on trial for laundering $400 million of Dr. Rouge's one-coin money through a series of shell companies and bank accounts called the Fenero Funds. On day one, the prosecution called out its star witness, who, after several months in prison, had recently pleaded guilty to fraud. What type of information did you provide the government with? about the crimes I committed and every information I had about OneCoin and the people related and the crimes that were committed in there. Their words, taken from the court transcripts, are read by actors. Did some of those crimes that other people committed relate to members of your own family? Yes, to my sister and to my mother. It was Dr. Rouge's younger brother, Konstantin Ignatov. During this time period, after Ruja disappeared. Were you in touch with Ruja? No. In exchange for a plea deal over multiple charges of fraud and money laundering, which carried up to 90 years in prison, Constantine had agreed to testify against Mark Scott and OneCoin. Did you make representations that you were in touch with Ruja? Yes, I did. Why did you make those representations? 
in front of the network so that everybody thinks that everything in the company is still going and everything is okay. Over the next three days, Constantin stunned the court with details about the inner workings of the OneCoin scam. More names, more leads. It was brother versus sister, like a TV courtroom drama. What properties did Ruja buy during the time period between 2015 and 2017? The London penthouse, another penthouse in Dubai, a mansion in Dubai, a big mansion at the seaside of Bulgaria, big mansion for her husband in Frankfurt, Germany, and various mansions in Sofia, Bulgaria. One of the things we'd never really figured out was what precisely happened in the weeks leading up to Ruja's disappearance. Constantine's testimony contained information which, for the first time, helped us understand why Ruja left when she did. And he introduced some new characters who are crucial to our story. In 2015, as OneCoin was growing fast, Ruja hired a man called Frank Schneider. Frank ran a private intelligence firm called Sandstone. And before that, he'd been one of Luxembourg's top spies. According to Constantin, Frank became something like a Mr. Fix-It for Ruja. And in mid-2017, one of the problems Ruja asked him to fix was her love life. Ruja was married, but she was having an affair with a flash American financier in his 50s called Gilbert Armenta, who was helping her move money. Did Ruja ever discuss her relationship with Gilbert Armenta with you? Uh, very often. Uh, they were talking about leaving their spouses, moving together, marrying and having kids. They were even talking about how they wanted to name the kids. Where was Gilbert living at that time of this conversation? In Florida. You mentioned that Ruja told you during this conversation that Gilbert Armenta was in trouble with the FBI. Is that correct? Yes. How did Ruja obtain that information about Gilbert Armenta being in trouble with the FBI? An apartment below Gilbert Armenta was bought and a hole was drilled so a microphone was placed in Gilbert's dorm. Who was involved with the purchase of that apartment? One of Frank Schneider's people bought the apartment and pretended to live in this apartment and he was also drilling the hole in the ceiling to place the microphone. What was the purpose of placing the microphone in the hole through the ceiling? She did not trust Gilbert if he really wants to leave his wife. Frank Schneider told us that neither he nor Sandstone nor any affiliated or contracted entity purchased or acquired or rented any property or asset in the United States or carried out any bugging or monitoring operation of Gilbert Armenta's premises. He said, The statements made by Mr Ignatov to this extent are false. But whoever it was, someone was helping Ruzha and someone had bugged Gilbert Armenta's flat. And in late September 2017, Ruja even phoned Gilbert and confronted him about what she'd learned from the secret recordings. What she didn't realise was that Gilbert had already agreed to work with the FBI and an agent was recording their calls. I had an amazing day. I had again my fucker coming and informing me what's going on. And some of those calls were played to the courtroom. I love the tape that you and your wife, where you tell you that you're not marrying me. I love this one. I'll keep it like whenever I want, I'll listen to it again. This is the first time we've heard Ruja outside of her inspirational cryptocurrency visionary act. It's a completely different person. Angry, frustrated, barely holding it together. You know, this is the shit that I'm getting every day and I think, what the fuck am I having? Normally I said to them, I don't want to listen to shit like this anymore, but this one actually was good to hear. Gilbert, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, really? You, I never thought that you like a spineless asshole, are you? Well, the the big issue right now is... No, no, no need, no need. I don't want to hear it because it's actually very clear. I was like, it's just like shit, like everywhere, just dirt. It's disgusting, actually. I don't want people to lie to me. I throw up. Do you understand? I throw up my dinner. I know people are assholes, I know people can be weak, I know people can do a lot of things to get what they want or whatever, but I don't deserve this and she does not deserve this and whatever you think you are and that you're smarter than anyone, it's not. You understand? It's just not. It's not cool. There's one thing that's called personal integrity. Google it. It might be good. You understand? 
I'm sure you do. So good night to you. And in another call, a couple of days later, another clue. Gilbert, we can get access to your emails within 24 hours if we want to. You cannot prevent this shit. You have to be fucking careful. What these Russian guys can do, you cannot imagine. If they can do it, everybody can do it. Yeah. The only advice that you get from me, do not use emails. Do not, like, just face-to-face -face or encrypted phones. Nothing else is safe. Just believe me. Please. Like, okay. I can get everything I want within 24 hours. And if I can, they can too. I'm really worried. You have to be careful with communication. Everybody has to be careful with communication, like extremely. I think at this point, late September, Ruja knew that trouble was brewing, but she didn't know how bad it was. She was trying to figure out what the FBI might already know, what Gilbert Armenta might share with them. Roughly a week or so later, so early October 2017, Constantine went to see Ruja at one of her mansions in Sofia. She looked exhausted and nervous, he said, like she hadn't eaten or slept for days. You also mentioned that your sister told you about information that she had learned about Gilbert Armenta working with the FBI. Is that right? Yes. What did she tell you about that information? She told me that Gilbert Armenta is an international money launderer and also involved in several other crimes and that the FBI got him or something and that he was uh, talking to his lawyer and to several other people that he wants to make a deal with the FBI. And as part of this deal, he wants to offer Ruja and everything, according to her. Ruja was last seen on the 25th of October 2017 when she took Ryanair flight FR6300 from Sofia to Athens. Konstantin had booked that flight for Ruja on the 23rd of October. And she told me that she wants me to book her a flight for two days later to Vienna. And she said she would be traveling there, but she would be back very soon. I don't have to be worried and to stay calm. What happened after that? I booked a flight for her to Vienna on the same day. And the next day she called me that she needs for this day. She wanted to fly to Vienna to fly to Athens. I asked her if she wants me to cancel the flight to Vienna and she said no. She started screaming at me that she needs both flights, so she got both flights. I didn't cancel any of them. On next day, Ruja and one of her security guards flew to Athens and the security guard came back alone the same evening. He told me that he left Ruja there and there were people who took her and she continued traveling with them. Did he say anything about the individuals who met her at the airport? The only thing that he said was that they are speaking Russian. Did you know of any connection between Ruja and anyone in Russia? In the last month before Ruja disappeared, she told me that she met somebody who is very powerful and rich from Russia, but I never met him and she also never told me his name. Powerful Russians again. She'd mentioned them in the phone call to Gilbert Armenta. We're coming back to the trial and the events leading up to Rouge's disappearance in a moment. But first, let's talk about Rouge's UK connections. Via the court transcripts and a bit of digging of our own, we've learned that Rouge set up a family office in central London in May 2016. Hi, how are you? I'm all right, how are you doing? Oh, not too bad. A lawyer called Gary Guilford was the director. What is a family office? Because I don't really know what that, what that means. Well, my understanding was that the money that she had earned, uh, we would be looking for private equity investments, kind of make money on the money that she'd already made. I suppose people with a lot of money, they don't put it into a bank account. They invest it in um, opportunities to make more money. So this office was like just to really help make the most of her personal fortune. That that was the intention, yes. We found new premises in Knightsbridge. Knightsbridge? So what was the address? Uh, one, Knightsbridge. Still, are you still the director? Well, it hasn't been functioning for a long, long time. But um, the problem is, is that that company entered into a four-year lease of the premises at one Knightsbridge, which we couldn't get out of. 
we still owe Westminster City Council business rates of about £60,000. Oh, so you've actually so, still got debts to pay as a result of all this? Well, there's no money left. Um, I paid off all the credits as I could. For several months before she disappeared, Rougia was planning to move to London full time. She even bought a penthouse in Kensington. I heard it was very, very nice. There was a swimming pool inside the penthouse. Jeez. She was about to have her baby daughter and uh, she was looking for somewhere to bring up her daughter. I think she did think London was the place. So who's, who's Frank Schneider? Who is Frank Schneider? Um, no, what his precise role is, uh, I don't know, but he would often, uh, gosh, how can I say this? If Bruce wasn't available, I might try and uh, track down Frank Schneider to try and ask him to speak to Rouge if I can contact him myself to get some oh. instructions. He seemed very, very close to Rouge. You're a lawyer. How on earth could you have gotten into this without thinking something's wrong? Without thinking you needed to investigate more? Without yeah. thinking there's too much evidence here that this company is not one I want to be involved in? Yes, I was nervous working there. And yes, um, I did think that there were lots of legal and regulatory issues. But um, I'm, I'm also aware of fake news. Now, there did seem to be a lot of evidence against one coin and one life. But from the inside, from the level of experts that I could see prepared to work for her, it gave me comfort. And I was, to some extent, reliant on them to tell me you know, whether or not it was illegal what they were doing. According to Gary, two of the companies hired here in London were the famous law firm Carter Ruck and a reputation and relationship company called Chelgate. Carter Ruck sent out letters threatening legal action. We've seen two, one to a journalist and one to a OneCoin investor, who'd both criticised the company online. Now, a lot of companies do this and everyone is entitled to legal action. But it is one way that wealthy people and large companies use their money to defend their reputations. And if you're not rich, it's hard not to back down. And there's more. You might remember that the UK's Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, who are responsible for regulating the country's financial sector, had issued a warning on its website about OneCoin in September 2016. But then the FCA removed that warning 10 months later. At the time, we remember thinking it didn't really make any sense. This was an obviously risky investment that Brits were pouring millions into. At the time when I think Carter Ruck and Chalgate were involved, the Financial Conduct Authority had put a warning on their website about anybody doing business with one coin of one life. So Carter Ruck and Chalgate were writing to the Financial Conduct Authority, whatever they did was convincing enough for the FCA to take the notice down. Gary just said that the UK's FCA warning about the biggest scam of the last 20 years could have been removed following pressure from a British law firm and a reputation management company. What we needed was someone who actually worked for one of these companies. And then, in a stroke of luck, we were contacted independently by someone who'd been listening to the podcast and said he had some information he wanted to share. I started working for an agency in London called Chelgate in August 2017. His name is Simon Harris. And guess what he told us? One of the first files I was handed as a communications operative was one for one coin and one life. While there, Simon heard a lot about Frank Schneider, the former spy from Luxembourg. He was the one that employed Chelgate. So if you like, there was one step removed. If you asked Chelgate, did you uh, ever have one coin as a client? They could probably honestly say no, although they did work for one coin. So tell me a little bit about Chelgate. What sort of company are they? What sort of things do they do? Chelgate purports to be a crisis management PR company. OneCoin was, I mean, it was a massive monthly retainer in excess of £40,000. For, so for £40,000, what sort of things would Chelgate give you for that amount of money? To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure I can answer that. 
it seems an unbelievable amount of money. But there's one thing I can tell you they did. In the weeks prior to my arrival on August 2017, there was a warning on the FSC website. There was the FCA. About FCA, I point. said FSC, yeah, yeah FCA. FCA, yeah, FCA. Yeah. And Chelgate worked with Carter Ruck to pressurise to weakening their public stance on one coin. Gary Guilford and Simon don't know each other. They've never met each other. But they both told us an almost identical story. And I know that Frank and Ruja were absolutely delighted, so pleased with the changing of the wording on this website. This was being used as part of the marketing around the world when people said that, well, look, you know, you're under investigation in England and they can turn around and say, no, the FCA, you know, the FCA has actually changed its mind about us. It was about spin, no more. And it seemed to work. Good afternoon, everyone. It's me, Ken Levine, coming live once again from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Here's the OneCoin promoter, Ken Levine, talking about the FCA's decision. Well, the reason I'm doing this video, though, it goes back to those videos when I was talking about that FCA warning that the UK has now taken down. So guys, it's no longer an assumption or it's being updated or any of that nonsense that these haters want you to believe. Now, here we go, guys. Here's the official answer. As we believe the warning has been on our website for a sufficient length of time to make consumers aware of our concerns. And it's just that simple, guys. There's the answer right from the horse's mouth. It's official. Well, we got all these other people going out there being like, one coin's banned, one coin's this, one coin's under investigation, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm sorry, but if they still thought we were a fraudulent company, one coin, then guess what? That warning's not removed. Game over. As far away as Uganda, we'd heard similar stories, how the removal of the FCA warning gave people confidence that OneCoin was no longer considered fraudulent by one of the world's top regulators. And we think it resulted in millions more being invested. I'm David Hooper. I've been a libel lawyer for the best part of 50 years. David, who's now retired, was one of the country's top libel lawyers. And one of the law firms he worked for was Carter Ruck. We tell David about what we've learned so far about Rouge, OneCoin, Chelgate and Carter Ruck, including some of the meeting agendas we've seen. Meeting with Chelgate, 18th of July, 2017. Pursuing legal action purely as a PR exercise. One Life, One Coin agenda, Wednesday, 22nd of November, 2016. Visit to Sophia for Chelgate and Carteruck. Carteruck Management, Task Bullets. Prioritise legal action takedown letters to be written with Carteruck. Provide as it comes defamatory material that requires action and or needs to be flagged. She obviously is an immensely wealthy person. She's entitled to come and say, I have been live because the sort of things people were saying at that stage about it being a scam, you know, are on the face of it libelous. You can't say they're a bad law firm because they act for discreditable people, because discreditable people are entitled to use the English law courts, and they do. Do you think that a lot of these clients, including Rouge, I suppose, would never have actually wanted it to go to court? That is where probably some of the scam elements would be exposed. That's absolutely right. There's a high element of bluff in these cases. Very often a letter is written to try and stop people pursuing a story. Once it comes to trial, there, there are witnesses, you have to disclose all sorts of documents and looking at the Carter Ruck letter is to sort of look at the last paragraph to see whether they're saying we're going to sue you in 14 days or whether they use some formula like we anticipate being instructed to commence proceedings. You know, that may well be a clue that there's a certain element of hot air in the letter. By the way, the letters we've seen say they intend to pursue a claim. Then we get to the FCA warning and Carter Ruck. When they take on a case, they, they, they tend to fire on all cylinders and one can't criticise them 
for trying. And if it was as a result of their efforts, they produced a very good result for their clients. But the fact that the FCA took this notice down seems to me quite shocking. Their obligation is to protect the integrity of the financial system and to secure an appropriate degree of protection of the consumer. And quite clearly, they failed to do this. One of the other reasons was that it had been up, the warning had been up for long enough. It would be fair, fair enough if, if this was all history and that the company had been wound up. But as I understand it, people were investing millions. What then happened was that OneCoin started using the fact that the notice had been taken down as proof, sort of vindication, that the FCA no longer considers OneCoin a risky investment. In fact, it now thinks it's a perfectly safe investment, otherwise the notice wouldn't have been removed. Well, un unless they're completely naive, of course it was going to be used as a marketing opportunity. I mean, having got involved in the matter, they, they clearly had responsibilities you know, not to pour a bucket of whitewash over one coin. Before speaking to David, we'd placed a freedom of information request to the FCA, asking for all correspondence between them and Carter Ruck, Shellgate or any other legal and PR firms. They told us, we can neither confirm nor deny the existence of these documents, citing confidentiality. They've said that this was confidential information and, and that I don't think is right. This isn't, in my view, confidential information. I think you certainly should appear in it, yeah. We contacted the FCA, Carter Ruck and Chelgate for comment. Carter Ruck told us, We cannot respond to your inquiry for professional reasons including client confidentiality. Shellgate told us, OneCoin and Ms. Ignatova had their own PR slash media relations facilities, and we were not carrying out any kind of media relations program. We were among a group of professional advisors providing counsel on a complex and evolving situation. We do not disclose fee arrangements, but the assignment was a substantial one, in fee terms well short of our largest, but certainly complex and demanding significant activity. I do not believe that the FCA notice was removed for any other reason than that the FCA considered it was appropriate to do so. And we contacted Frank Schneider. He told us... Chelgate was at some stage hired as a PR consultant. He went on to say... To my knowledge, Chelgate had no involvement in any interaction with the FCA or any influence on their decisions. The FCA told us... We published the consumer notice in 2016 at the request of the City of London Police. The decision to take our alert down was made in conjunction with the City of London Police who were investigating the matter. Our alerts are primarily intended to warn consumers about firms carrying on regulated activities without the required FCA authorisation. It did not appear that OneCoin was carrying on any activities that required FCA authorisation. The FCA does not regulate crypto assets and therefore it could not take this matter further. Needless to say, we sent an appeal regarding our Freedom of Information request to the FCA. Now, back to Rouge's disappearance on the 25th of October 2017. We were interviewing Gary and Simon about Rouge's London connections. But quite often when you interview people, it's the little throwaway things they say that are the most important. You sometimes wonder how on earth you managed to get wrapped up in this story. <laughs> Oh, I totally do, yeah. It's a complete nightmare. Gary Guilford, the lawyer who ran Rouge's London office. Especially looking back, at the time, you know, seeing the professionals that were working and were willing to work for her, regulators were starting investigations, then dropping investigations from what I could see. So the fact that, like, the FCA took their notice down meant that you, you were more confident in thinking, you know, we'll carry, this, this company's legit, well, we're going to carry on working here. It, it, it definitely did. So looking back, I still can't reconcile the fact that, um, you know, she was so excited about moving to London. You know, if she planned to disappear, then why would she be sending me 
text messages about how excited she was. You were communicating yeah. with her? When was this? Late October 2017. And well, she disappeared on the 25th of October. Um, I've got WhatsApp messages between me and her that go back to about the 25th of October, yes. So when hang on, let me just get, very... let me get this straight, Gary. So you're saying that just before the 25th of October, you'd been arranging to meet her in Sofia? That's correct. We've been building up to this meeting now for the previous two weeks. We were going to have dinner. She more or less disappears on the day that I was due to be meeting her. And I'd received a text message from her confirming that meeting maybe a couple of days before she disappeared. So what does um, that mean then, Gary? What does that mean in terms of her disappearance? Not, well, not planned at all? It would suggest to me that it wasn't planned. It was all very sudden. Then there was something that Simon from Chelgate told us. Another innocuous comment, but another piece of the puzzle. So the day I left as well, there was a huge development. So I gave my notice in and then they, instead of making me work the three months, which is the contract, they only made me work two weeks. But there were huge developments in the hmm. end of the first week of October. I was just looking at my diary now. And I remember that they literally left the building to meet somewhere privately to talk. I wasn't invited, but I thought it was very odd that they went off site to talk about this contract when there was at least two conference rooms. It was odd that they didn't want to talk about it in the office. So, and you know, and you're sure it was the end of the first week. You've got that in your diary. So it was, and so that would have just, these dates are actually weirdly important. Just scroll, where am I up to? Um, um, 18. I left on the 6th of October. So it was the morning of the 6th of October. That's interesting. The dates are really interesting. So something big was happening yeah. um, on the 6th of October. It was. October. I, think I, I think I know what it was. So, Georgia, once we, like, take all these little bits of the puzzle, put them all together, mm -hmm. I, I, think we're, I think we're starting to see really what happened in those days leading up to her disappearance. It's starting to feel like we're getting close, isn't it? Hmm. Should we see how it sounds? OK. Here goes. In September 2017, Rouge spies on Gilbert Armenta and finds out he's not leaving his wife. I never thought that you were like a spineless asshole, are you? But she also learns that the FBI might be onto him too, and she's worried about his sloppy security. You cannot prevent this shit. You have to be fucking careful. On the 6th of October, Rouge learns that the FBI might already have information that will lead to her. There were huge developments in the hmm. end of the first week of October. She told me that Gilbert wants to make a deal with the FBI. As part of this deal, he wants to offer Ruja and everything. That's why Ruja doesn't turn up to the big OneCoin event in Lisbon on the 7th of October, where she was due to speak. That event that first got many OneCoin promoters worried. She was on her way. We, we knew that two days before she was, she was in the programme. And nobody knew where is Dr. Ruja. But Ruja still thinks she can somehow fix this. On the 21st of October, she's even arranging a meeting with Gary and Sophia. I'd received a text message from her confirming that meeting maybe a couple of days before she disappeared. But then she learns something important on the 22nd or 23rd of October, which changes everything and forces her to leave. It would suggest to me that it wasn't planned, it was all very sudden. She plans to go to Vienna, then suddenly changes her mind and goes to Athens instead. She started screaming at me that she needs both flights. Where she meets Russians. She met somebody who is very powerful and rich from Russia. And then vanishes into thin air. Based on what we found out over the last few months, we now think that Ruja didn't plan to leave when she did. She learned something important on the 22nd or 23rd of October, which forced her hand. What was it? According to the Department of Justice, she was initially indicted on the 12th of October 2017, two weeks before she vanished. 
It was a sealed indictment, meaning it wasn't public. What's more, there was also a German investigation into OneCoin, which was hotting up around the same time. The US authorities said something during Constantin's bail hearing, which took place before he pleaded guilty, which suggests that the timing of her disappearance was not a coincidence. The government's investigation revealed that Ruzsa and other OneCoin principals acquired unauthorized access to otherwise confidential information regarding law enforcement operations. Did someone tell Ruzsa that the German or American authorities were about to arrest her? If she was tipped off or being protected somehow, the question is, by whom? Back to the Mark Scott trial. In the end, the jury only took a couple of hours to find him guilty of laundering $400 million of Rouge's money. And thanks to the court records, we now know what companies Mark was sending all that money to. We know, for example, that 185 million euros ended up in a horse racing fund in Dubai. 51 million euros went to a tobacco firm in northern Greece. We're still working through all of this, but one payment in particular caught our eye. A few months before she vanished, Ruzsa sent 6 million euros to a Bulgarian company called LBJ. Now, according to the Bulgarian company register, LBJ is majority owned by the supermodel girlfriend of a man called Hirostophoris Amanatidis, aka Taki a Greek-Bulgarian in Dubai who's an alleged drugs kingpin. He's known in the criminal underworld as the Cocaine King. That's not the only payment she'd sent to Taki's people. Three and a half million euros went to the same person a year earlier. And here's another thing the US Justice Department said at Constantin's bail hearing. According to our investigation, we do believe that the defendant is directly associated with significant players in Eastern European organized crime. The head of security of OneCoin is a large-scale international drug trafficker. And it's actually that same head of security that was involved in the disappearance of the defendant's sister when she absconded from the filed charges in her case. And we know he knows and talks to the head of security because that phone number was recovered from the phone of the defendant. We believe this is Taki, the cocaine king. Is it possible that some of these payments and Rouge's disappearance are connected and that those connections might lead us to where she is now? The hunt for Dr. Rouge is back on. They're using state institutions uh, as a shield for their crimes and as a baseball bat for their enemies. And it's taking us to a place where organised crime, business, politics and money all meet. Next time. If you said that, that uh, two weeks uh, after American government issued an arrest warrant, she disappeared, yeah. uh, some, somebody should tell her and uh, I'm... Uh, pretty sure that uh, it wasn't somebody from the American government. And what would she have needed to have done to make sure then that no action was taken? I, I can guess. Money. She paid for her uh, freedom. I wonder what might happen when the money dries up, when there's no more money left. <laughs> there is no brilliant uh, future for her because these people for sure don't like her. They like her money. Because we've just been thinking, nobody has seen her 100% sure for several months. I understand. Hmm. I understand. This is only confirming what I have said. The longer she has money, the safer is uh, she. We'll be back as soon as we have more. It won't be next week, but I can promise you it will be before OneCoin finally opens its public exchange. The Missing Crypto Queen was presented by me, Jamie Bartlett, and produced by Georgia Cat. It was written by me and Georgia Cat. 
The music was by Phil Channel and Desislava Stefanova and the London Bulgarian Choir. The editor was Philip Sellers. It's a BBC Documentaries production for BBC Sounds. We'd also like to thank a couple of citizen journalists who've been providing us with some really helpful information that need to stay anonymous. If you have any information to share, our email is cryptoqueen at bbc.co.uk. Do you think Dr. Ruja is evil? Perhaps, but I don't think it's useful to label anyone evil. In my opinion, Dr. Ruja sounds like she may have been well-intentioned to begin with, and then got caught up in her own web of lies. I'm criminal psychologist Dr. Julia Shaw, and I'd love to tell you about a new podcast, Bad People, with me and comedian Sophie Hagen. I've spent my whole career trying to work out why people do bad things, 